Hi, so I know that some of you weren't in class the other day. I think there was a little confusion about what Monday I was actually missing. And so um, you missed us finishing up uh, the last chapter, but um, suddenly we realized I hadn't done anything in chapter 30. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the child with neuromuscular or muscular dysfunction. Uh, this chapter really covers some things that... I wasn't aware that it was going to cover, but um, probably should have been in the neuro one, but everybody looks at things a little bit differently. Uh, cerebral palsy is a group of permanent disorders of movement and posture, and they cause activity limitations. I think we've all seen people at one time or another that had various uh, degrees of cerebral palsy. Usually what we find is that it happens, um, there's, a, there's a disorder that happens during um, fetal or newborn periods that cause this disorder. Uh, in some cases, it may uh, involve just sensation. In other cases, it may um, involve their way of perceiving the world. In other Times it may affect communication. Um, it can affect cognition or their ability to understand things. And uh, there may be a behavioral uh, side to it as well. The incidence is about 2.4 to 3.6 per thousand live births, so it's actually fairly common. And it's the most common permanent physical disability in childhood. Uh, about 80% of children with cerebral palsy will also have seizures that are associated with it, and so they'll develop epilepsy. Interuterine hypoxia or asphyxia are one of the major causes of, of CP. Uh, sometimes there can be pre-existing prenatal brain abnormalities. Um, there can be some genetic factors involved with it or clotting disorders. Uh, I've seen cases uh, with the clotting disorders where children actually are born having had a stroke um, bef uh, in utero, uh, which is very unusual. Um, but it is something that happens on ultrasound or MRI. It shows as a healing uh, injury rather than a new injury that would have happened because of a birth trauma. Uh, it can come because of a malformation of the brain. It can also be uh, related to um, intrapartal asphyxia, uh, maternal exposures or uh, to medications or to trauma. Uh, it often is something that we see in preterm infants. In fact, it's very common in preterm infants. And so with them, we see a combination of increased cerebral blood flow that leads to a bleed, which also leads to hypoxia of the area. Or we may have hypoxia associated with the delivery or uh, periods of time after the child is born. And so that's kind of what happens with the preterm baby. Um, and we also see that if there's maternal infection as well with that. And um, also uh, preterm or postterm birth uh, after 42 weeks. So you're not supposed to be inside of your mom at 42 weeks. You're supposed to already be out in the big world. And so we start seeing changes in the placental flow, and that may affect um, the oxygenation for the infant because the placenta starts to die. It's not supposed to be there um, providing oxygenation and uh, nutrition any longer. We do see some postnatal cases, and in the postnatal cases, usually we're seeing extremely low birth weight or very low birth babies um, that are being affected by this. We may also see kids that have bacterial meningitis. Uh, if there's been multiple births, especially if there's only uh, one placenta for two babies, that's uh, more common. If there's viral encephalitis, 
uh, if there's been a motor vehicle crash and uh, also with child abuse. Um, we see CP very frequently in survivors of shaken baby syndrome. In about 80%, uh, CP is caused by no identifiable cause. There's various types of CP. Uh, usually the type that's associated with preterm birth is the spastic diplegia. And it's usually caused by hypoxic infarction or a hemorrhage uh, in the periventricular uh, area. And what we see is over a period of time, that area becomes, um, there's very little blood flow in that area. And so because that area is adjacent to the lateral ventricles, that's how it gets its name. Um, the athoid um, is known as the extrapyramidal um, type of CP is most likely associated with birth asphyxia, but it can also be caused by cernicterus and metabolic genetic disorders like mitochondrial disorders or glut glutaratic aciduria. The athroid or dyskinic cerebral palsy um, results in worm-like movements of the extremity and the trunk and the face uh, you, um, and the tongue. Uh, they often have a lot of drooling and speech problems. Uh, they lead to chorea, which you all have seen videos of what chorea looks like in both pathophys and in uh, peds. And um, the hemiplegic or the hemiparetic CP is uh, often associated with focal cerebral infarctions or strokes uh, that are secondary to intrauterine or perinatal thromboemboli. Uh, they usually uh, are a result of maternal thrombosis or a hereditary clotting disorder. Uh, cerebral hypoplasia and sometimes neonatal hypoglycemia are also related to the at ataxic CP. And with ataxic CP, we have rapid repetitive movements. Uh, the child walks with a very wide gait and uh, they have an inability to hang on to objects. With the general corticoid or uh, cerebral atrophy, uh, we often see severe quadriparesis um, and cognitive impairment, and we often will see microcephaly either um, early on or developing as the child grows. The mixed or dystonic cerebral palsy is usually a combination of the spastic and the athroid uh, types. To diagnose it, uh, basically we assess uh, in early infancy, especially if we know that there is a high risk for kids having CP. Uh, we use uh, assessment tools throughout the first two years of life because usually you're going to see signs and symptoms uh, of the uh, diplegia uh, happening. A neurological exam is very important. Uh, the caregiving giver telling the, um, per, the people doing the assessments what they observe at home. Because sometimes you get kids into clinics and they don't do the same things that they do at home and all of a sudden they look like a totally different kid than what you see at home. So when the parent tells the um, providers that they observe certain behavior at home or the provider may even ask questions to find out if they've seen those kind of behaviors at home is a very important piece in diagnosis. Uh, with CTs and uh, MRIs, normally I see MRIs done more than CTs. CTs have kind of lost their, their glows uh, after the MRIs came out. Uh, and so most of the kids are sent down for MRIs to evaluate for leukomalacia. Also, they do metabolic and genetic testing because you don't want to say that somebody has CP when they have a metabolic or genetic problem. 
Some of the possible motor signs that we see are things like persistence of primitive reflexes. Primitive reflexes are things like the Babinski reflex or the grasp reflex, uh, poor head control after age three months. Uh, stiff and rigid limbs are what we see a lot. Um, and then arching back or pushing away. Uh, basically, like I showed you in class, these kids just arch their back way back. Sometimes you wonder how in the world they're able to do it. And it usually starts out as arching in the um, neck and shoulder area. And it may start very subtly, just throwing their head back and the shoulders also go back as well. But then as it progresses, it goes farther and farther down their back and so until finally they're almost like a C going backwards. Um, and so it's something that we watch very closely. In the same way that there may be stiff or rigid limbs, we may see the opposite as well. And we may have very floppy tone. They may not be able to sit without support at age eight months. So if you remember looking at your developmental uh, guidelines for infants, you ought to, uh, children ought to be sitting by themselves around six months of age. Uh, they're also, they also will clench their fists after three months. That kind of goes along with that persistent primitive reflexes is that kids will often lay with their fists, um, we call it fisting. And uh, if they're still doing it after the age of three months, that's an abnormal normal thing. That doesn't mean that kids don't make fists, um, but it means that they consistently uh, sit that way. One of the other really strong motor signs is that when they start to walk, they walk on their toes. They don't put their heels down. Uh, we also see a scissoring of their legs. So if you think about it, it's as though one leg crosses over like a pair of scissors. And that's another very strong sign, and it's usually associated with those stiff and rigid limbs, and then they point their toes down, and then their legs cross over. Some of the possible behavioral signs include excessive irritability, no smiling by the age of three months, feeding difficulties, um, meaning that uh, when you go to feed them, they're constantly thrusting their tongue so that it looks like they're trying to spit the bottle out. Uh, when they are feeding, they don't have a good uh, suck, swallow, breathe coordination, so they're frequently gagging or choking with their feedings. Uh, there may be some sensory impairments, like they may not be able to see as well. They may not um, have good hearing. Uh, there may be impaired behavioral or interpersonal relationships. So if you think about if you have a baby that doesn't respond to you, so you're smiling and, and cooing and everything with this child, but the child doesn't respond in a similar way, which is what you expect babies to do, it affects interpersonal relationships. Also, there uh, is often altered learning and reasoning, especially if there's more behavioral signs. The therapeutic goals for CP is to establish the locomotion. We want them to move. Uh, we want them to be able to communicate, and we want them to be able to do as many self-help skills as possible. We want them to be able to do their ADLs as they're getting older. We want them to gain optimal appearance and integration of their motor functions, uh, correct associated defects as effectively as possible. So if you think about how they're being, how they're positioning themselves, it affects their ability to move later on in life. We want to provide adaptive educational opportunities, especially if there's a cognitive uh, part of their defect. And you want to promote socialization experiences with other affected and unaffected children. So if they were only with unaffected children, they would start feeling like, what's wrong with me? But if they're with other kids who have similar problems, then they're going to say, oh, this is just part of who I am. 
and other people have similar problems. So they're going to have people that they identify with because they're like them. But then there's also the uh, ability to make friends and be with other children that are unaffected. So earlier intervention programs, both in and out of the hospital, are very important. So normally what I, since uh, premature babies are so affected by this, uh, I see physical therapy come and work with these kids early on in the process. Basically, once premature babies become uh, stable, uh, we start having physical therapy come and start working with them, making sure that they have good range of motion, that we're not seeing early signs of CP. Uh, family education and support is very important, as well as school and social supports. Dental care is often very important uh, because often if they have seizures, they may be getting fuentuan or dilantin, uh, which can cause gum dysplasia. And with the gum dysplasia, they, they have more difficulty uh, getting uh, with bleeding gums and getting um, their, their teeth really cleaned over this hyperplasia of the gums. Uh, also, they can, they often, if they're not eating well, the decreased oral intake can lead to more tartar buildup. You know, kind of like how you feel first thing in the morning before you brush your teeth, only excessively more. And then uh, well child care, as far as someone to take care of these kids. Um, braces and supportive devices. Uh, you see this little one down here. Uh, in the picture, uh, basically what they do is they make um, a mold sort of of the foot and how they want the foot to be positioned. And then they put a Velcro type, a soft Velcro around to hold it in place. Sometimes they'll actually put some little socks on them uh, so that their little toes stay nice and warm and cozy, and um, but yet you're still able to, to provide support that's needed. Uh, it's important when they are in their braces that you check to make sure that there's good circulation to the toes, that they're not getting, uh, that the, uh, that the straps aren't too tight. Uh, but usually they're made so that uh, they can't be put on too awfully tight. Um, what's your, what you're seeing here is an ankle foot orthosis, uh, and it's used to help prevent and reduce the deformities that come from pointing their toes all the time. And uh, it also increases the uh, energy efficiency of their gait and uh, helps to control alignment. Um, we may uh, surgically do tendon lengthening procedures uh, because if you think about it, one of the reasons that they are walking on their toes is that they've been pointing out and you get a uh, atrophy of the Achilles tendon. And so it, it basically makes it so they have to be in that position. So they may do tendon lengthening procedures for that. They may release spastic muscles uh, if there's hip or abductor muscle spasticity or contractures uh, that will improve their ability to move. Uh, surgery also can be performed to improve their caloric intake and correct their gastroesophageal reflux disease uh, to help prevent aspirations. So they may have a Nissen fundoplication done uh, they can also end up having their dental problems corrected as well. Their medications are often given uh, either by a pump or intermittently. Uh, Tegretol and uh, Divelt Pro-X uh, um, are some of the ones that are used for uh, seizures. And um, other medications like Levodopa, or um, some of the other medications 
will tr help to treat their chorea or, or their atherosclerosis. Gabapentin is also known as Neurotin, uh, has been used uh, to decrease the spasticity pain in children that have CP. So if you think about having um, spasms in your muscles all the time, um, that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about spasticity pain. All of them need to be weighed for risk-benefit ratios and monitored for maintenance of therapeutic levels and uh, making sure that we don't that they don't grow out of their doses or that they are getting um, toxic levels. Some of the additional problems that are common with children with CP include constipation. Uh, it's caused by the neurologic defects and lack of exercise. They may have poor bladder control uh, and urinary retention. They may have osteopenia, and that's related to the decreased bone density caused by their immobility. Remember, if you don't do exercises where there is um, resistance, then you will your bones become less dense. So we get osteoporosis. Uh, there may be they may be prone to chronic respiratory tract infections. Uh, they may have problems with airway clearance. Um, they may have aspiration pneumonia uh, as a result of gastroesophageal reflux. Uh, and so there's a lot of things that may uh, result from these. Children that are wheelchair bound uh, may have problems with pressure areas. Um, if their braces don't fit properly, they, they may cause pressure areas as well. And then just like the kids with hydrocephalus, these kids are prone to latex allergies. So here's just some pictures of these kids. Um, this one's got some little roly um, crutches that he's using. And you can see how instead of standing straight up and down, he, he walks with his knees bent. Um, this little guy has his trike and he has, you can see his orthotics that they're using, but that helps him to be able to move with his, his trike. Um, often kids with CP, like I said, will do tongue thrusting. And so if you hold their jo lower jaw, that can help uh, to uh, feed them easier. And you can kind of see him tongue thrusting in the white lower picture. There's a wide variation of IQ with uh, CP. In about 70% of CP patients, the IQ is completely normal, and it can even be high. Um, so it's difficult to assess uh, depending on the other physical uh, problems that they're experiencing. If they have dis difficulty talking, it's sometimes difficult to understand how, how high their IQ actually is. And um, basically with all of these kids, we want to promote growth and development and have them develop to the highest level that they possibly can. The rigid, atonic, and quadruparetic CP patients have the highest incidence of profound um, cognitive impairment. When we look at nursing care, we need to provide frequent rest periods that spastic um, movements uses up a lot of energy. We want to give them increased caloric intake for the same reason. We want to watch their skin care closely. We've talked about that. Safety-wise, they may need to wear helmets, especially if they're unstable on their feet or in the way that they're moving. They need to make sure that they get their immunizations so that uh, they don't develop uh, diseases that they don't need to have to develop. They may need special car seats way beyond uh, the normal period for car seats for children of the same age. And the family needs a lot of support and usually uh, qualify for various um, uh, financial supports to help them to provide what they need to help their child.
In class today, we talked a little bit about neurotube defects, as I did want to go by these. It's a failure of closure of the neurotube. It uh, may involve just a small section of it, or it may involve the entire length of the neurotube. Uh, it's especially common in people who have English, Scottish, or Irish backgrounds. Uh, also, I believe there's some Scandinavian countries that are associated with it as well. It tends to affect more girls than boys. It's three times more common in Caucasians and Hispanics than in African Americans. I, you know, I started thinking back all the years that I've been in the NICU, and I, I don't remember ever taking care of an African American baby that had, uh, uh, as, had spina bifida. Um, it is one of the most common birth defects in the United States. Uh, there's a number of different reasons that it can uh, be caused, and you all can read down these as well as I can, so I'm not going to spend much time with it. The major uh, issue is low folic acid levels or folate levels. And so if you look at this, if the maternal nutrition does not have supplements of folic acid or does not eat foods that are high in folic acid, greens are what we really look at for that. Um, it causes a genetic mutation in the folate, folate pathways, um, and they believe that's one of the causes of uh, spina bifida. As far as prenatal management, uh, we routinely give all mothers supplementation with folic acid as soon as they know that they're pregnant, uh, usually 0 0.4 milligrams per day. However, if there's a familial history of neurotube defects, we increase that to 4 milligrams per day. Uh, in 1998, the Food and Drug Administration started having all cereal grains uh, fortified with folic acid. And all of the supplementation needs to begin before conception. So if you happen to be one of those people that have those high-risk um, genetics in your background, like being Irish or Scottish or English, uh, you may want to start those up long before you plan on getting pregnant. Uh, we usually do prenatal and antenatal assessments for risk of neurotube defects, usually by fetal ultrasound. And um, they can do antenatal surgical interventions, but it isn't what's normally done. So some of the diagnoses that we see, uh, ways of diagnosing neurotube defects, is by amniocentesis and checking the alpha fetoprotein levels. Uh, that's done between 6 and 18 weeks. Uh, on uterine ultrasound, uh, it'll show the extent of the lesion, and so you can make plans for it. And then genetic uh, counseling is uh, usually done as well to see if there may be a genetic cause. Um, one of the reasons that we want to know early is that if somebody is planning on terminating a pregnancy because of um, the neurotube defect, they need to know before 20 to 24 weeks, depending on the state laws. Also, we want to schedule a cesarean birth to manage the sac um, during labor so that there's no um, pull on it or... Um, in many cases, the sac is intact and there's no drainage of the cerebral spinal fluid. And so we don't want to cause the sac to rupture during the birth process. There's two different types of neurotube defects that we're going to talk about. The first is uh, anencephaly and the second is spina bifida uh, or a myelomeningeal seal. So your book here kind of shows um, what happens with the bones of the spine with, with a neurotube defect. And it's good to kind of review this so that you know the difference of what's in it and what's not in it. With anencephaly, there's an absence of the cerebral hemispheres. So in other words, there is no cerebral areas. And sometimes there may be some 
some skin over the top of the head. Sometimes there's not. Uh, sometimes I've seen a couple cases of a hydro seal, which basically was the same as an uh, anencephaly, except that the skull had formed and the area under the skull was just full of water. Um, it wasn't like a hydrocephalus where it was contained in the ventricles. It literally was just water sitting up in the cranial area. Um, but most of them tend to look something like this. And um, the brainstem function usually is intact. And that's what's really kind of sad about this whole situation is that these kids breathe on their own. They will take a bottle on their own. They'll suck, swallow, and breathe as though nothing is wrong with them. Because all of those things are reflexes that are controlled by the brainstem. As the brainstem becomes less involved in those activities, because eventually you, you lose your suck. And so when that's gone, then this kid would die. Um, also, initially the brain stem is controlling breathing much more than it does later on, where it's controlled more by the CO2 levels and the oxygen levels. So what we end up seeing is that within a few hours to a few days, as these changes are going on, these kids, the brainstem slowly stops taking care of some of these things. The reflection, the reflect, the um, reflexive um, patterns go away, and so then the child isn't able to maintain themselves. Also, if they do manage to live a little longer, this exposed brain area, it makes them at higher risk for infection. So they either die of respiratory failure or they die of massive sepsis. There's two types of spina bifida, um, and the spina bifida is failure of the osseous spine to close. Um, the spina bifida occulta is not vi visibly, is not visible externally, and the spina bifida cystica is a visible defect, and we have a sac-like protrusion because of it. With the spina bifida occulta, it's usually in the lumbar lumbosacral area at L5 to S1, and uh, some of the skin indicators. Um, are a sacral dimple, which is what this picture is, a sacral angioma or a port wine nevis, um, sacral tufts of dark hair. Uh, some of the pictures were just kind of pathetic. Uh, often it's just tiny little tufts of hair that's there, but they tend to be dark colored. Even if the child is blonde, it's kind of an interesting thing. Or they may have a sacral lipoma, so they have a little fatty deposit. With spinal uh, bifida occulta, one of the biggest things that they're concerned about, in and of itself, it's not a major issue for the child that has it unless there is a tethered cord. And with that, it's an abnormal adhesion to the bony or fixed structure near the cord. And the problem is it puts traction on the cord, and that leads to their gait being changed, uh, could give them bowel or bladder problems, and you may see foot deformities um, that show up after infancy. We diagnose these um, by doing an x-ray. Uh, initially, they may see an abnormality of the bony areas, um, and then they'll do a follow-up MRI or CT. Uh, in some cases, they may do an ultrasound, but normally they want to do something a little more um, higher level than an ultrasound because they're looking for um, the tethered cord, and they can see that better on an MRI. Spina bifida cystica um, is where you have the visible defect with an external sac-like protrusions. There's two types of it. There's a meningeal seal and a myelomeningeal seal. And you might say, well, what's the difference? Well, like we said, with spina bifida, we have abnormal bone 
formation. So if you look at these pictures, this picture on the left is the normal spine. And you can see where the vertebrae is and the, the facets on the vertebrae. Uh, you can see where the spinal cord is passing and where the meninges uh, passes through. Well, if you look over at the spina bifida occulta, you can see that we don't have those facets and um, that you, you know, everything else looks pretty normal, but you see this little hairy tuft or fatty tissue like with the lipoma. And with the lipoma, usually there's no, we're not worried too much with it. With the meningeal seal, we have spinal fluid that's protruding in this sac-like uh, protrusion. Um, but the meninges is still where it's supposed to be. But with the meningeal myelocele, we actually have the spinal nerves that are coming out into that sac as well as the uh, spinal fluid. So we can see here that in these cases, um, this is what they look like. You can see one's really big and, and you can see how thin the uh, area is on it with the myelomeningocele on the left and with the uh, one on the right with a ruptured sac. Uh, the one on the right, you can almost see that there's, there's some skin over it. Um, and you would almost think that it would have been protected more than the one on the left, but you can see why these babies are delivered by C-section and not allowed to be uh, vaginal deliveries. When we look at the sac, there may be a fine membrane. Um, however, that's prone to leakage of the cerebral spinal fluid and it's very easy to rupture it. Uh, it the sac can be covered with dura, meninges, or skin. Um, when it's not covered, it tends to cover with skin rather rapidly. Uh, with the meningeal, meningeal myelocele, uh, the location and the severity of the defect determine how much impairment the child can have. There are some kids that they have, you know, this nice little meningeal myelocele, they go into surgery and because it's very low, they have minimal problems afterwards. They may have a little bit of problems with stooling or something like that, but in general they do very well. They're able to walk. In other cases, the higher the defect is, the more problems they're going to have. So if the defect is below the second lumbar vertebrae, we end up with a flaccid paralysis of the lower extremities and there's usually a sensory defect. Um, often it may not be on both sides of the body. Uh, it could be worse on one side versus the other. Initially, when we care for kids with um, myelomeningocele, uh, it's definitely a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, neurosurgeons are involved with it, orthopedic doctors are involved with it because of the need for um, help with their mobility. Uh, there will be physical therapists, occupational therapists, there will be um, uh, just all different types of uh, nutritionists and other people involved. They'll, uh, these kids are usually in the neonatal intensive care units uh, prior to and after surgery. And the primary thing that we're worried about is to prevent infection. So we don't want that sac to rupture if it isn't already ruptured. And we don't want to get anything like stool on that sac. We want to assess their neurologic and associated anomaly. So do they have developmental dysplasia of the hips? Uh, do they have club foot? Is there any genital urinary deformity with them that may affect uh, them later in life? Um, usually we try to get the, these kids to surgery within 12 to 72 hours after birth. It has a lot to do with how stable the child is. If they have respiratory problems uh, because of being premature when they're born, 
uh, we may wait more like 72 hours before we take them to surgery because we want to make sure that they're stable. There's nothing worse than taking an unstable child to surgery. Uh, and so it's important to try to, to get early closure because that prevents stretching of other nerve roots and uh, causing further damage. And of course, we want to promote family bonding as much as possible. Most of these kids have to lay on their bellies uh, so that there's no pressure on that sac. If they're going to be 72 hours before surgery, sometimes we just can't get them scheduled into the OR, and so they may be 24 or 48 hours. Um, we may put them like up, like lift them up, put them on a on a pillow or something like that, and then and when I say put them on a pillow, they're still prone uh, on a pillow, and then lay the pillow in the mother's lap so that they can hold their baby. Um, we wouldn't want them to just hold the baby themselves because the baby might slip or something like that and then something could happen to the sac where if they're on something like a pillow then there's less chance of them slipping off or having pressure put on that sac. Some of the ongoing management as far as uh, post-operative care and follow-up we want to prevent joint contractures uh, we want to prevent or minimize any motor or sensory deficits. Uh, we want to acquire the best possible lower uh, extremity function and prevent skin breakdown. Uh, we're going to be doing passive range of motion exercises with them. Uh, they may actually have positional stretching exercises done at home. They may be, have braces or special walking devices that are custom, uh, which are like custom built wheelchairs to improve their mobility. Uh, surgery is rarely recommended, except on the ones that um, need help uh, improving their sitting position. They get a functional scoliosis and kyphosis if they're wheelchair bound. Um, they're in the because they're in the chair all the time, they tend to kind of move off to the side and get into poor positions, and that can cause them to get scoliosis or kyphosis. And in those, they actually put rods in their back so that they sit up straight, uh, and, and the scoliosis is not allowed to become worse. Um, most of these kids are followed up in wound care because they have a tendency uh, for skin breakdown, and the, they are the most frequently seen children that are in the wound care because of um, being in their chairs all the time and not moving and having that weight on their sacrum all the time. As far as family support and education, um, we need to help them plan home care routines uh, prevent, tell them, teach them how to prevent complications and assess for latex allergies. Uh, basically, like the uh, hydrocephalus, we really are moving away from using latex products in these kids because they do have a tendency to have numerous surgeries over their lives. So the fewer times that we can bring them in contact with, the lace, with latex, the better. Uh, when we look at latex, it's a serious health hazard to children with spina bifida. They're at high risk for allergy because of repeated exposure to latex um, uh, products. And uh, other kids that are associated to have latex allergies include those with uh, urogenital anomalies, uh, the kids with tracheoesophageal fistula, uh, preterm infants, those that have uh, shunts, uh, those that have CP, or spinal cord injuries. And so all of these kids, we try to keep their latex exposure as low as possible in an attempt to avoid latex allergies. Uh, when we look at um, allergic reactions, we can get everything from just itching and wheezing to a rash and anaphylaxis. Uh, the reactions tend to increase in severity when the latex comes in contact with the mucous membranes uh, in the bloodstream or in an airway. Uh, 
one of the things that you really have to be aware of when it comes to latex allergies is if somebody has a latex allergy, then they, are, they, they can get a reaction from eating bananas, avocados, kiwis, and chestnuts. Um, one of those things to kind of keep in the back of your mind, especially when we're talking about infants, because more, um, bananas are one of those things that is really common for us to give little kids to eat. It's usually one of those first uh, fruits that we give them. It's sweet and they like it, but this is definitely a case where we wouldn't want to give kids uh, some of these foods because, again, we're trying to reduce substances that may um, start them down the road to an, a latex allergy. The goals are to reduce exposure to latex for spina bifida patients who are at risk of developing the allergy. We want to remain alert for the development because they may go for a long time, have no problem at all, and then suddenly they have um, signs of the latex allergy. And we're going to create a latex safe environment for any allergic individuals, but also for those that are at high risk for developing it. Spinal muscular atrophy um, type one is also known as Morden Kaufman disease. And I'm going to tell you some of these things are very rare and you're probably not going to see them much, but we'll kind of go over them pretty quick. It's an autosomal recessive trait. So remember what I told you before. It's important for you to understand what auto, autosomal recessive versus autosomal dominant um, type genetic um, inheritance patterns are. Um, because I don't know what it is, but these boards and people love genetic questions. Uh, some, it is one of the most common paralytic form of uh, floppy infant syndrome, also known as congenital hypotonia. There's three subtypes that are based on age of onset, the severity of symptoms, and the clinical course. Basically what happens with it is there's progressive weakness and wasting of the skeletal muscles. And uh, it's due to degeneration of the spinal cord and brain stem, and it results in atrophy of the, of the skeletal muscles. Uh, the age of onset is variable. Uh, the earlier it comes on, the poorer the outcome is. Uh, it's usually seen before the age of two and progresses to death from respiratory failure. Uh, I actually had a child that I took care of, got to know the, the parents really well, uh, and just the sweetest family that, that could be. And uh, it just was very sad when this child died. The therapeutic management is uh, it's diagnosed by an electromyography and muscle biopsy. Treatment is primarily symptomatic because there is no cure for the disease. Uh, and so basically what you're trying to do is prevent joint contractures and treat any orthopedic problems that they can have. And the worst thing that they can have is scoliosis. Uh, they may get hip subluxion, which is kind of the things that go on with hip dysplasia and dislocation can occur with them as well. Uh, these kids usually benefit from powered wheelchairs and powered lifts and special pressure adjustable mass mattresses to help their skin to not have skin breakdown. Uh, what's really sad about it, though, too, is that they have normal intellectual ability, so they kind of know what's going on with them. Uh, the intermediate uh, SMA uh, type 2, it usually happens between 2 and 12 months of age. Uh, first, there's weakness in the arms and legs, and later there's generalized weakness. Uh, they often have a prominent pectus excavatum, which means that their little um, sternum sinks in. <laughs> you could put water in it. Um, so excavate as excavatum uh, means that there's a dip where there shouldn't be a dip and um, movements are absent absent during relaxation and sleep uh, their lifespan is anywhere from seven months to seven years Kugler-Whelan syndrome is a type 3 version of it. 
and its onset is in the first year of life. They have normal head control and they can sit by age six to eight months, uh, but their thighs and hip muscles are weak. Some will actually learn how to walk, uh, but it slowly is progressive, but they do have a normal life expectancy. As far as management goes, we're gonna promote respiratory function as long as we can. Um, make sure that the orthopedic and skin care concerns are being addressed. We're going to promote safety for them, which means we are looking at airway in many cases. And we're going to promote nutrition so that they have good nutrition. We need to prevent infections and complications associated with their uh, loss of muscle uh, control and support the family and the child with chronic and palliative care. And usually with these kids, they're in home care rather than institutionalized. Muscle dystrophies or M, you know, we have MDA, used to have Jerry Lewis on it. Now there's a whole bunch of different people hosting that. Uh, it's the largest group of muscular diseases in children. Uh, all have a genetic origin with gradual degeneration of the muscle fibers, progressive weakness, and wasting of the skeletal muscles. All of them have increasing disability and deformity with loss of strength. And so this picture really kind of shows the muscle groups that are involved with the muscular, uh, mus muscle, muscular dystrophies. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is also known as pseudohypertrophic muscular dystrophy. It's the most severe and the most common of the muscular dystrophies in children. It has a X-linked inheritance pattern, which as you know, means that you're going to have more boys with it than girls, although it can occur in girls. One third of these uh, children, it's a fresh mutation meaning that there hasn't, it, it hasn't occurred in other generations. Usually there's a positive family history in 60% of the new cases of Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and the inter incidence is one in 3,500 male births. There is a video here that if you look at this um, link, is a really good explanation of everything in, that's involved with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. And I'm going to recommend that you watch that video. It's kind of corny, but at the same time, it really does show um, and explain the disease process very well. Some of the characteristics that are associated with it is uh, appropriate developmental milestone early in life or just very subtle delays. The onset tends to be between the age of three and seven years of age, and uh, there's progressive muscle weakness, wasting, and contractures. What is kind of different about it, though, is that the calf muscles become hypertrophied in most of the patients, and there's progressive generalized weakness that occurs in adolescence. These kids usually die from respiratory or cardiac uh, failure. Uh, if there's a family history, they can do prenatal testing. And uh, if it's suspected based on clinical appearance, they'll also do uh, diagnostic evaluation. Uh, as far as the blood work that's done, they do a PCR for dystrophin gene mutation. Uh, since the problem is with the dystrophin um, in the muscles. Uh, there's uh, the confirmation is made by an EMG, which is our uh, muscle biopsy, and by serum enzyme measurements. The serum CPK and AST levels are high in the first two years of life before the on onset of the weakness starts coming. What we see in these kids is that they have a waddling gait, they frequently fall, and they have something known as the Gower sign, which um, is in the next slide. Uh, they also have a tendency towards lordosis, which if you remember is, is that uh, sway back where the belly sticks out. Um, they also have enlarged muscles, especially in the thighs and the upper arms. There's profound muscular atrophy in the later stages. And uh, in 
and in many cases, mental deficiency is um, there as well. So the Gower sign is that when a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy is trying to get up from a position on the ground to a standing position, they start out by pushing their torso upright with their knees straight. Uh, and then they walk their hands up to their legs and then push the rest of their body up by walking their hands up their legs until they're finally standing up. And this is seen with almost every kid who has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. The therapeutic management, there's no effective treatment that's been established. The primary goal is to maintain function. Uh, in the unaffected muscles as long as possible and to keep the child as active as possible. So range of motion, bracing, um, performing uh, activities of daily living for as long as possible, and in some cases they may need to do a surgical release of contractures. Uh, also they need to do genetic counseling for the family. Uh, some of the other goals is to promote uh, mobility. We've talked about how that can happen by administering steroids and calcium supplements, performing passive stretching and strengthening exercises, and maintaining cardiopulmonary function uh, by teaching deep breathing exercises and performing chest physiotherapy. You want to prevent complications and maximize the quality of life. Uh, by developing a diversional schedule, so in other words, going out and doing things that are fun and providing emotional support. We also want to support the child and family as the disease progresses and help clarify the roles of the different health care providers that are providing care. You want to help with chronic progressive incapacitating diseases and help design a program that will give them the maximal amount of independence for as long as possible. You want to also help deal constructively with their limitations as the disease starts imposing itself on their daily lives. Guillain-Barr syndrome is also known as, as infectious polyneuritis, and it's an acute demyelinization uh, polyneuropathy uh, with progressive paralysis. So in other words, their, their uh, nerves are becoming demyelinated. The ch children are less often affected than adults, so it's much more common in adults than children. However, we do see it in kids between the ages of 4 and 10. Uh, the late adolescents, young adults, and males are affected more than females. The pathophysiology is it's usually an immune-mediated disease. It often occurs about 10 days after a nonspecific viral infection, and it's been associated with some vaccine administrations. Uh, it's very rare that it happens after vaccine administration. Uh, we get inflammation and edema in the spinal and cranial nerves that progresses to impaired nerve conduction and then partial or complete paralysis of the involved muscles. Uh, it's diagnosed based on the paralytic manifestations or an EMG finding. The cerebral spinal fluid may have increased protein concentrations. Again, notice the word may. Uh, it doesn't mean that it always happens, but it can uh, be elevated. Some of the other uh, lab values are usually within normal. Uh, what we see is a symmetric paralysis um, rather than just one area or another. Uh, initially, the, there's muscle tenderness. There may be paresthesias and muscle weakness. So think about if the nerves don't have myelinization, it's going to cause that tenderness and that paresthesia. Paralysis rapidly ascends from the lower extremities and may involve the trunk, arms, and face. So in other words, the legs stop working, and you know, like lower legs, and then it moves up the body. Uh, flat, we get flaccid paralysis and loss of reflexes. And there can be intercostal and phrenic nerve involvement. So remember, intercostal talks about the, the lungs, the muscles of the chest. 
Uh, frequently, they have urinary incontinence or retention and uh, constipation. The treatment is symptomatic and involves the use of steroids, IV Im immunoglobulin, heparin, stool softeners, and analgesics. Uh, they may do a plasmapheresis, and that tends to help things move along much faster. Uh, they are given respiratory support and emotional support for the child and the family because they are alert and oriented. <laughs> Uh, we also want, are looking to prevent complications. As far as prognosis, there's better outcomes um, with the younger ages, and most of the patients have complete recovery. In most patients, the muscle function begins to return two days to two weeks after the onset of the symptoms, but there's a prolonged period until there's complete recovery. So that's often a very frustrating frustrating period of time for patients that have this syndrome. Um, most of the deaths that do occur are due to respiratory failure. Some of our nursing considerations uh, related to Billy and Barr syndrome is to have supportive care with a multi-member health care team to assess for early signs of respiratory distress or difficulty swallowing. Remember the the paralysis is starting from the lower part of the body and working its way up. So once you, we start seeing paralysis in the lower extremities, then we need to be watching for when it hits the respiratory system. Uh, we want to focus on prevention of complications, making sure that we're um, being aware of skin, nutrition, and muscle support measures and emotional support for the child and family. Tetanus. <laughs> it's also known as lock jaw. It's an acute, preventable, and often fatal disease, and it's caused by the exotoxin of Clostridium tetani. Uh, it's characterized by muscle rigidity involving the masseter and neck muscles, which is why we have a lock jaw. Uh, there's four requirements for, re for developing tetanus. The presence of the tetanus spores or of vegetative forms of the bacillus. Uh, injury to tissues, wound conditions that increase multiple multiplication of the organism. So in other words, uh, it's not clean or it's crusted over with trapped pus. And, ye, and the biggest thing to remember is that Clostridium is a, is a an, anaerobic organism. So when we have something that's not clean, it's crusted over, and this bacteria is under the skin, not getting oxygen to it, it's going to live longer and then a susceptible host. Uh, spores are found in the soil, dust, and gastrointestinal tracts of humans and animals, and the bacteria uh, enter the body through a wound, especially a puncture or a crush wound or a burn. Uh, so it's why when we step on nails or have other injuries that cause deep wounds, we get a tetanus shot. Uh, it may enter through a scratch, a bee sting, a thorn, or a needle prick, and exposure is greater during outdoor activities. The pathophysiology of tetanus is that the exotoxin spreads from the wound to the central nervous system by way of the neurons or the bloodstream, and it becomes fixed on the nerve cells of the brain stem and the spinal cord, and it's the toxin that produces the muscle stiffness. The clinical manifestation is initially there's progressive stiffness and tenderness of the neck and jaw muscles and then difficulty in opening up the mouth and uh, facial muscle spasm. It progresses until there's ophthalotonus, uh, difficulty swallowing, laryngeal spasm, and tetany of the respiratory muscles. Um, and then we uh, get rigidity of the abdominal and limb muscles. So we're getting harder and harder for to breathe. Um, respiratory manifestations are accumulated secretions, atelectasis, pneumonia, and respiratory arrest. So think about that as you are slowly getting so that you're moving the muscles less and less or are able to. Uh, you're going to be you're not going to be taking deep enough breaths. And the patient is anxious but alert. Um, their mentation is unaffected, so that this has got to be really scary. There's rapid heart rate, diaphoresis, mild or absent fever, 
The incubation period is about three to 10 days and mortality is approximately 30%. And it's usually fatal in the newborn. One of the ways that newborns get it is when they're born at home and they weren't prepared. Um, I had one doctor that I worked with that was from India and he said that tetanus is very, neonatal tetanus is very um, common there because they'll just take anything that they can to tie the umbilical cord and, uh, you know, an old shoestring that's been out who knows where. And so it's not, they get an oomphalitis, uh, meaning that their umbilical cord is infected and um, then it moves on into the respiratory system and kills the baby. Therapeutic management is prevention of tetanus by getting a tetanus shot or getting a tetanus antitoxin after exposure. Uh, treatment of wounds that are contaminated with uh, dirt, feces, soil, or saliva, or puncture wound, avulsions. You know, in other words, you're going to treat your wounds and not have them stay dirty. Uh, treatment should include the tetanus immunoglobulin if the patient is inadequately immunized. Uh, the therapeutic management is they're probably going to be in the ICU for constant observation and respiratory support if it's uh, needed. And we're going to monitor fluid and electrolyte status. Uh, tetanus immunoglobulin therapy uh, is given to neutralize the toxins. Wound care to decrease the proliferation of the organisms. Uh, they may be given muscle relaxants, sedatives, and neuromuscular blocking agents to, pr to stop that rigidity of the muscles. So other things that we want to look at as nurses is to control the environmental stimuli, um, combine the efforts with a multi-member care team, uh, careful monitoring of the respiratory status, and aggressive supportive care um, making sure that we are watching the respiratory status, the fluid and electrolyte balance, the nutritional support, and management of pain. If you think about your muscles being tight and not ever loosening up, it's going to cause pain. We want to also attempt to reduce the anxiety of the child and the family since they are complete, the child is completely and totally aware of what's going on and the family is definitely panicked. Botulism or food poisoning that's resulting from the ingestion of the toxin produced by the Clostridium botulinum. Uh, in older children, we get it with improperly sterilized home canned food. In infants, some of the sources are things like honey and light or dark corn syrup. The clinical manifestations of botulism, uh, they get CNS symptoms, uh, abruptly 12 to 36 hours after the ingestion of the food product. And uh, the general signs are weakness, dizziness, headache, diplopia, speech difficulties, vomiting, and progressive life-threatening respiratory paralysis. The treatment is IV botulism, botulism antitoxin. And supportive measures include respiratory support. They're going to end up on a ventilator. Uh, nutritional support, prevention of complications, emotional support, and family support and education, uh, and continued therapy until the paralysis goes away. With infant botulism, uh, again, it's caused by the same thing, but it's related to their ingestion of honey. A lot of people think about honey as being this all-natural thing that there's no problem, but it can cause botulism in, in infants because their bowel doesn't have a lot of air in it. Uh, it's a uh, anaerobic environment uh, where for most of us we have enough gas and air down in our bowels that this isn't as much of a problem for us. Um, and so it only takes just a little bit in the honey uh, to cause botulism with them. There's a wide variation in the severity of the disease from mild constipation to respiratory failure. Often the constipation is the presenting symptom for them. Uh, what we see is a general weakness, decreased movement, diminished deep tendon reflexes, loss of head control, feeding difficulties, weak cry, uh, diminished gag, hypotonia, do not treat the infants with botulism antitoxin.
Um, prognosis is generally good, but the recovery is very slow. We're talking weeks to months in infants. Moving right along to spinal cord injuries, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about them because we talked a little bit about uh, some of the injuries with the um, with the shaken baby syndrome, but we uh, you'll cover them more with adults. Uh, generally, it's the result of indirect trauma like motor vehicle accidents. Uh, vertebral compressions come with blows to the head or the buttocks like diving, surfing, falls from uh, horses or ladders or things like that. Uh, birth injuries usually happen from traction forces on the spinal cord, uh, especially like during a breech delivery. I'll tell you, one time I went to a, a breech delivery and I thought they would never get the head out. And they just kept pulling and pulling and pulling. And fortunately, that child did really well. But um, as I showed you in some of the other pictures with birth injuries, we get other types of injuries besides spinal injuries. Spinal cord injuries is like the um, higher end um, birth injuries. Uh, the level of sp spinal cord injury uh, has a lot to do with uh, long-term outcome. The higher the injury, the more extensive the damage will be. Paraplegia is complete or partial paralysis of the lower extremities. Uh, tetraplegia is the lack of functional use of all four extremities. It used to be quadriplegia, but uh, they changed the name. Uh, high cervical cord, and actually, even though they say they changed the name, um, it uh, is um, still being called quadriplegia. Uh, high cervical cord injury affects the phrenic nerves and it paralyzes the diaphragm and that requires ventilator dependence. Uh, I took care of a little boy uh, that he got $20 from, his, uh, from a family member for Christmas. He went down uh, the street to spend his money and an uh, older child came up and uh, put a gun to his neck and said, I want your $20. And the boy said, well, no way. You're not having my $20. And the older child shot him in the neck, gave him a cervical cord injury, and he um, required ventil uh, ventilator support the rest of his life. Uh, so these things do happen. And uh, you will, if you ever work in the PEDS IC, you will see things like that that's happened. Uh, the spinal cord injury management, initial management is stabilization and transport to a pediatric trauma center environment. Uh, management is complex. It's very controversial. Uh, often we give IV steroids to reduce the inflammatory response. It also gives us a little better idea of how bad the injury is, depending on what type of injury they, they received. Uh, surgery is often considered for de decompression, if that's something that's involved in the process of the injury. Uh, some of the nursing consideration is to stabilize and carefully assess them, uh, work to prevent complications. These kids are log rolled or put on special beds so that uh, there's no tension put on the spine initially. Uh, rehab evolves evalu involves evaluation and support. Often these kids are sent to rehab centers and they're there for months um, receiving uh, rehabilitation. So that it concludes this, and um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of this today, um, but we have uh, finished that up, and hope that helps you all, and I'll see you all on Wednesday. Bye. <music>